What is it, Alice, dear? Oh, Helen, it's such a hot afternoon. And I'm getting so tired of sitting here on the bank of the pool and having nothing to do. Aren't you tired? No. I've got a book to read. I don't think I'd like that book. Why not? Well, it hasn't any pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book without pictures or conversations? Oh, dear. The hot afternoon was making Alice feel very sleepy and stupid. And she was wondering whether the pleasure of making a daisy chain would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies. When suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. Oh, dear. Oh, my fur and whiskers. I should be too late. Let me look at my watch. Oh, dear. I know I should be too late. Oh, my fur and whiskers. Oh, dear. Well, I've never seen a rabbit with a waistcoat pocket before. Or with a watch to take out of it. I must see where it goes. So Alice jumped to her feet and ran across the field after it. And she was just in time to see it pop down a large rabbit hole under the hedge. In another moment, down went Alice after it. Never once considering how in the world she was to get out again. The rabbit hole went straight on like a tunnel for some way. And then dipped suddenly down. So suddenly that Alice hadn't time to stop. Oh, I'm falling. And she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep well. Oh. I'm still falling. Well, either the well is very deep, or I'm falling very slowly. Yes, it's more like floating down, really. Whatever next? It's too dark to see the bottom. Oh, there are cupboards and shelves on the sides of the well. And the shelves have got jars and bottles and all kinds of things on them. I wonder whether I could take down a jar from one of the shelves. I'm falling so slowly, I think I could. There. I've got one. It's labelled orange marmalade. But oh dear, it's empty. How disappointing. Now what shall I do with the jar? I'd better not drop it, or it might fall on someone's head at the bottom of the well and kill him. I know. I'll try and put it in one of the cupboards at the side of the well. There. And I still haven't reached the bottom. I wonder how many miles I've fallen by this time. I must be getting somewhere near the centre of the earth. I'm still falling. Down, down, down. I'm afraid Dinah the cat will miss me very much tonight. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time. Oh, Dinah, my dear, I wish you were down here with me. There are no mice in the air, I'm afraid, but you might catch a bat, and that's very like a mouse, you know. But do cats eat bats, I wonder? Do cats eat bats? Do bats eat cats? Do cats eat And here bats? Alice began to get rather sleepy and went on saying to herself Do in a dreamy sort of bats? way. Do bats eat cats? You Do see, cats? as she couldn't answer either question, it didn't much matter which way she put it. She felt that she was dozing off when suddenly... Oh! Down she came upon a heap of sticks and dry leaves. Alice was not a bit hurt and she jumped up onto her feet in a moment. Before her was another long passage, and the white rabbit was still in sight, hurrying down it. There was not a moment to be lost. Away went Alice like the wind after it. Oh, my ears and whiskers, how late it's getting, oh dear. And suddenly the rabbit disappeared round a corner. But when Alice turned the corner after it, the rabbit was nowhere to be seen. Alice found herself in a long, low hall with doors all round it. I wonder where they all lead to. She went all the way down one side of the hall and up the other side, trying every door. Oh dear, they're all locked. How am I ever to get out again? Oh, what a funny little table. It's made of solid glass. And there's a tiny golden key lying on it. But the key's much too small to unlock any of the doors. Unless, perhaps, Behind this little curtain. Oh, yes! There's a tiny little door about 15 inches high. Yes, it fits! Oh, there's the loveliest garden I ever saw, with flowers and fountains and everything. I wish I could go and play in it, but I can't even get my head through the doorway. And even if my head would go through, it would be of very little use without my shoulders. I wish I could shut up like a telescope. I think I 
could, if I only knew how to begin. For you see, so many out-of-the-way things had happened lately that Alice had begun to think that very few things indeed were really impossible. Well, it's no use waiting here. I wonder whether there's anything else on that glass table. There's a little bottle. That certainly was not here before. And there's a label on the neck of the bottle. It says, drink me. Well, it's all very well to say drink me, but I'm not going to do that in a hurry. No, I'll look first and see whether it's marked poison or not. Because if you drink much from a bottle marked poison, it's almost certain to disagree with you sooner or later. No, it's not marked poison, so I'll taste it. Mmm, very nice. A sort of mixed flavour of cherry tart and custard and pineapple and roast turkey and toffee and hot buttered toast. Yes, I'll drink it. Oh, what a curious feeling. I must be shutting up like a telescope. And so she was. She was now only ten inches high. Just the right size for going through the little door into that lovely garden. But when she got to the door... Oh, bother! I've forgotten to bring the little golden key to open it. Then, when she went back to the glass table for the key, she found she was now much too small to reach it. Oh, bother! But soon her eye fell on a little glass box that was lying under the table. She opened it and found in it a very small cake on which the words eat me were beautifully marked in currants. Well, I'll eat it. And if it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key. And if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. So either way, I'll get into the garden. And I don't care which happens. She ate a little bit, holding her hand on the top of her head to feel which way it was growing. And she was quite surprised to find that she remained the same size. So she set to work and very soon finished off the cake. Curiouser and curiouser. She was so much surprised that for the moment she quite forgot how to speak good English. Now I'm opening out like the largest telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. Oh, my poor little feet. I wonder who will put on your shoes and stockings for you now, dears. I'm sure I shan't be able. I shall be a great deal too far off to trouble myself about you. You must manage the best way you can. But I must be kind to them, or perhaps they won't walk the way I want to go. Let me see. I'll give them a new pair of boots every Christmas. How funny it'll seem, sending presents to one's own feet. And how odd the address will look. To Alice's right foot, hearthrug, near the fireplace with Alice's love. Oh dear, what nonsense I'm talking. Just at this moment, her head struck against the roof of the hall. Oh! In fact, she was now rather more than nine feet high. And she at once took up the little golden key and hurried off to the garden door. Poor Alice. It was as much as she could do, lying down on one side to look through into the garden with one eye. But to get through was more hopeless than ever. She sat down and began to cry, shedding gallons of tears until there was a large pool around her, about four inches deep, and reaching halfway down the hall. After a time, she heard a little pattering of feet in the distance, and she hastily dried her eyes to see what was coming. It was the white rabbit, returning splendidly dressed, with a pair of white kid gloves in one hand and a large fan in the other. Oh, my ears and whiskers. Oh, the Duchess, the Duchess. Oh, won't she be savage if I've kept her waiting? Oh, dear. If you please, sir. Oh, whiskers. The white rabbit was so startled that he dropped his white kid gloves on the fan and scurried away into the darkness as hard as he could go. Alice took up the fan and gloves, and as the hall was very hot, she kept fanning herself all the time she went on talking to herself. Dear, dear. How queer everything is today. I wonder if I've changed in the night. Let me think. Was I the same when I got up this morning? But if I'm not the same, who in the world am I? I'm sure I hadn't changed to Ada, for her hair goes in such long ringlets, and mine doesn't go in ringlets at all. And I'm sure I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of things, and she, oh, she knows such a very little. Besides, she's she, and I'm I, and... Oh, dear, how puzzling it all is. I'll try if I know all the things I used to know. Let me see. Four times five is twelve, and four times six is thirteen, and four times seven is... No, that's all wrong, I'm certain. I must have changed for Mabel. I'll try and recite how doth the little... How doth the little crocodile 
improve his shining tail, and pour the waters of the Nile on every shining scale. How cheerfully he seems to grin, how neatly spreads his claws, and welcomes little fishes in with gently smiling jaws. Oh, I'm sure those are not the right words. I must be Mabel after all. And I shall have to go and live in that poky little house, and have next to no toys to play with, and oh, ever so many lessons to learn. No, if I'm Mabel, I'll stay down here. But oh dear, I'm so very tired of being all alone here. As she said this, she looked down at her hands and was surprised to see that while she was talking, she'd put on one of the rabbit's little white kid gloves. How can I have done that? I must be growing small again. She got up and went to the table to measure herself by it and found that she was now about two feet high and was going on shrinking rapidly. She soon found out that this was because of the fan she was holding, and she dropped it hastily, just in time to save herself from shrinking away altogether. That was a narrow escape. As she said these words, her foot slipped, and in another moment... <coughs> she was up to her chin in salt water. Her first idea was that she had somehow fallen into the sea, but she soon made out that she was in the pool of tears, that she had wept when she was nine feet high. So she swam around, trying to find a way out. I wish I hadn't cried so much. I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. That will be a queer thing to be sure. What's that splashing about over there? It sounds like a walrus. Or could it be a hippopotamus? I'll swim over and see. Same size as me. Of course, I'd quite forgotten. I'm a size of a mouse myself now. It must have slipped and fallen into the pool of tears, just as I did. I wonder if it'd be any use speaking to it. Oh, mouse, do you know the way out of this pool? I'm very tired of swimming about here, oh, mouse. Well, it winked at me then, but it didn't say anything. Perhaps it doesn't understand English. I dare say it's a French mouse. I'll try it with a sentence from my French lesson book. Oué, Marchat. <gasps> oh, I beg your pardon. I quite forgot you didn't like cats. Not like cats? Would you like cats if you were me? Well, perhaps not. Don't be angry about it. And yet I wish I could show you our cat, Dinah. She's such a dear, quiet thing. And she sits purring so nicely by the fire, licking her paws and washing her face. And she's so good at catching mice. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. We won't talk about cats anymore if you'd rather not. We indeed, as if I should wish to mention such a subject. My family have always hated cats. Nasty, no, vulgar things. I don't wish to hear the name again. <laughs> oh, I won't mention it. Are you, are you fond of... Dogs? Dogs now? Whatever next you need. <laughs> oh dear, I'm afraid I've offended it again. Mouse dear, do come back and we won't talk about cats anymore. Or dogs either if you don't like them. Please, Mouse dear. Oh, oh very well. Let's get to the shore. And then I tell you my history and you'll understand why it is I hate cats and dogs. I can see the shore over there. So you follow me, Mouse. By now, the pool was getting quite crowded with birds and animals that had fallen into it. There was a duck and a dodo, a lorry and an eaglet, and several other curious creatures. Alice led the way, and the whole party swam to the shore. They were indeed a queer-looking party that assembled on the bank. Birds with draggled feathers, the animals with their fur clinging close to them, all dripping wet, cross and uncomfortable. The first question, of course, was how to get dry again. They had a consultation about this. And after a few minutes, it seemed quite natural to Alice to find herself talking familiarly with them, as if she'd known them all her life. Indeed, she had quite a long argument with the lorry. Nonsense, you're quite wrong. Why am I wrong? Because I said so. But why should I be wrong just because you say so? I'm older than you and I must know better. I don't believe you are older than me. Yes, I am. 
Well, how old are you? Shan't tell. Quiet, everybody. The mouse is trying to speak. Yes, yes, thank you, Dodo. Now, now sit down, all of you, and listen to me. I'll soon make you dry enough. Uh, are you all ready? This is the driest thing I know. There is silence all round, if you please. William the Conqueror, whose cause was favoured by the Pope, was soon submitted to by the English. Edwin and Marka, the Earls of Mercia and Northumbria... That doesn't seem to dry me at all. In that case, the best thing to get us dry would be a caucus race. What is a caucus race, Dodo? Why, the best way to explain a caucus race is to do it. Now, I'll mark out the course. In a sort of a circle like this. That's not a circle. The exact shape doesn't matter. Now the duck can stand here. Why? And the mouse here. Oh. And the lorry here. Yeah. And the magpie and the two guinea pigs over there. <laughs> and, uh, and some of you over there. And you... Here, my dear. All right. But the duck has started running already. Why not? And the lorry. Well, naturally, in a caucus race, you begin running when you like and you leave off when you like. But how do we know when the race is over? I'll tell you. So, when Alice and some of the animals had been running for half an hour or so and were quite dry again, the dodo suddenly called out, the race is over. Who's won? <laughs> Who's won? This requires a great deal of thought. Ah, everybody has won. And all must have prizes. But who's to give the prizes? Yes, why, it's who? Why, she, of course. Who, me? But I... Prizes, 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 prizes. prizes. Alice had a box of sugar plums in her pocket, so she handed them round as prizes. There was exactly one apiece all round. But she must have a prize herself, you know. Of course. What else have you got in your pocket? Only a symbol. Hand it over here. Thank you. We beg your humble acceptance of this elegant thimble. <laughs> Alice thought the whole thing very absurd, but they all looked so grave that she did not dare to laugh. And as she couldn't think of anything to say, she simply bowed and took the thimble, looking as solemn as she could. Then they all sat down again in a ring, and Alice begged the mouse to tell them something more. You promised to tell me your history, you know, and why it is you hate cats and dogs. <sighs> Mine is a long and a sad tale. It is a long tale, certainly. But why do you call it sad? And she kept on puzzling about it while the mouse was speaking, so that her idea of the story tale was something like a mouse's tale. Fury said to a mouse that he met in the house, Let us both go to law. I will prosecute you. Come, I'll take no denial. We must have a trial. For really, this morning, I've nothing to do. Said the mouse to the cur, Such a trial, dear sir, with no jury or judge, would be wasting our breath. I'll be judge, I'll be jury, said cunning old Fury. I'll try the whole cause and condemn you to death. Child, you're not attending. What are you thinking of? Oh, I beg your pardon. You had got to the fifth bend of your tale, I think. I had not. You insult me by talking such nonsense. I didn't mean it, but you're so easily offended, you know. Oh. Please come back and finish your story. No. No. Certainly not. No. What a pity it wouldn't stay. I wish I had our diner here. I know I do. She'd soon fetch the mouse back. And who is Dinah, if I might venture to ask the question? Oh, Laurie, Dinah's our cat. <laughs> and she's such a capital one for catching mice, you can't think. And though I wish you could see her after the birds, why should eat a little bird as soon as look at it? <laughs> this speech caused a remarkable sensation among the party. Some of the birds hurried off at once. One old magpie began wrapping itself up very carefully. 
I really must be getting home. The night air doesn't suit my throat. Oh, oh, come away, my dears. It's high time you baby canaries were all in bed. Oh. Come. I wish I hadn't mentioned Dinah. Nobody seems to like her down here. And I'm sure she's the best cat in the world. Oh, my dear Dinah. I wonder if I shall ever see you any more. <laughs> and here Alice began to cry again, for she felt very lonely and low-spirited now that all the birds and animals had gone away and left her. But in a little while she heard a pattering of footsteps in the distance. It was the White Rabbit. The Duchess. Oh, my fern whiskers, she'll get me executed as sure as ferrets are ferrets. Where can I have dropped them, I wonder? Alice guessed in a moment that the white oh, rabbit was looking for the oh, fan and the white kid gloves, and she very good nature began hunting about for them. But they were nowhere to be seen. Everything seemed to have changed since her swim in the pool, and the great hall with the glass table and the little door had vanished completely. Very soon, the rabbit noticed Alice as she went hunting about and called out to her. Why, Mary Ann, what are you doing out here? Run home this moment and fetch me a pair of gloves and a fan. Quick now! Oh dear, he takes me for his housemaid. Oh dear! Quick now! Oh dear. Hurry up, hurry up! Oh dear! Hurry up! 